Um, so welcome everybody online and in the room to this month's Synapse seminar, which is hosted by um, the Initiative for Evolution of Cultural Diversity and also the School of Culture, History and Language. Um, and I'd like to start by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri traditional owners on whose land we're meeting here in Canberra, um, paying respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, and today it's great pleasure to um, introduce Sam Passler, who is a research fellow here in ECTI, um, and he works across a number of different disciplines, anthropology, psychology, linguistics, economics, um, but all with a focus on understanding the history and movement of different cultural phenomena, such as language, music, environmental behaviours, um, political and economic structures and religion. And he's also done um, work, or worked extensively on kinship, and that's what he's going to talk about today. So thank you very much, Sam. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm going to stand up because I have to go stand up. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about my work on uh, kinship terminology uh, and mostly looking at global comparisons on the variability and recurrence of structures in kinship terminology. Uh, and to begin with, I just kind of want to establish what I mean by kinship terminology and what I don't mean, basically. Um, so kinship terminology uh, is effectively the system of words that we use to describe our family. And these in English are things like mother, father, brother, sister. Uh, and each of these words we call a kin term. And there's uh, quite a lot of discussion about how we can analyze kin terms. Um, do we analyze them? Uh, with respect to how they're used in everyday conversation, uh, so to how we extend them and use them to define relationships, or do we use them specifically with reference to family? And so most of my analysis restricts it to the application to family members and to these genealogical relationships. Um, and so there's a few uh, visual guides that I'm just going to go through quickly that will come up a few times in the talk. Um, the main, is, main thing you're going to see a lot of is these kinship diagrams and where circles of women, so mother and sister, triangles of men, father and brother. Parallel lines is going to indicate a marital or ethanol relationship, single lines genealogical relationships. And you're always going to see that the diagrams are focused around a particular person who are going to be in red. In this case, it's a woman speaking, but it could be a man speaking, or I might have a different shape, but it doesn't matter if the gender person speaking. And in general, I'm going to refer use color to indicate whether the same kin term is used for a particular relative. So you can see brother is uh, on here twice, and it's the same color. Um, one other thing I haven't got on here is the height of the individuals indicates their relative age. So the one that's above the speaker is old brother, below the brother. And this kind of genealogical, uh, so we have this genealogical web, and then we're applying this cultural, uh, the cultural structure of kin terms on top. And that's what I'm gonna base a lot of the research on today. Um, so you might say something like, well, I don't actually use the word term mother to refer to my parents. I say mum, for example, and that's not changing the structure. So we're not so interested in the forms. Um, but for example, I might say that my uh, brother's, uh, my brother's son is my nephew. Uh, but I wouldn't say that my cousin is my nephew, because that seems weird. But that's exactly how they organize it in Dutch. So why these structural differences occur? So uh, you can see here, this is how we would say nephew, my brother's son, niece, nephew, comrade. But in Dutch, you also use that to refer to your male cousins. And so why do these structural differences occur? Uh, this has been like a, a long-standing anthropological question. Um, and the reason we're interested in these structural differences is because human kinship is so diverse. We're interested in understanding why there's so many different ways uh, in which we care for each other, which we find mates, and how we cooperate with relatives. Um, why is that so much more diverse than we see in any other species? And we've often thought maybe kinship terminology are the key to unlocking this, um, or at least telling us something about why it's so different. And so I have three main uh, topics that I'm interested in kinship terminology. The first is um, based around that last point. Does kinship terminology relate to kinship behaviors in any particular way. Um, and are there, and this is, uh, does this have any macro level implications? The second is just how diverse are kinship terminology? Um, 
and how does that diversity, how can we um, explain that diversity? And then finally, the final study I'll talk about is whether um, these differences in and differences in kin categorization can influence behavior in a, in a more direct sense. So this is like at an individual level. So the first project I'm going to talk about came out of my PhD with my supervisor, Fiona Jordan. Um, and we're asking the question, does kinship terminology co-evolve with kinship behavior? And if your eyes are good enough to read the title, you'll probably figure out what we found, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. Um, so if we, looking, if we go back in time to, say, the mid-1950s, a lot of kinship terminology diversity was generalized to exist under these, um, into this typology. And this typology came about by um, combining two uh, principal rules that they thought that were reason to describe most, uh, most diversity in kinship terminology. And it's the presence, of, presence or absence of collateral, collaterality and bifurcation. And I'll just tell you what it is once I get to the next page and I get the definition right. Um, so collateral, collaterality is when you, whether you differentiate between your lineal kin and um, collateral kin. So what does that mean? Uh, if we look at the lineal example, we see, um, I've tried to indicate the presence of the absence of those two rules with C or not C, which is with a macron on top. So lineal does have that rule. And we distinguish between uh, a nuclear family and, and the siblings of our parents, for example. So uh, we don't use the same word for father as father's brother or mother's brother. Uh, the other rule is bifurcation. So does it, basically this means does the gender of the person through whom you trace the relationship matter? So if we go to the one below, bifurcation merging, where we have the presence of bifurcation. Uh, if we're tracing to my father's sister, we have the orange color. And if we trace to my mother's uh, sister, we have yellow. So the gender of who we're tracing through matters for that distinction. Whereas in English, it doesn't matter because we call an aunt uh, regard an aunt regardless of it's through my mother or my father. And so if we have those two rules, we get the top four types. And this was thought to be the general principles of kinship terminology. If we add one more rule, we get two more types, which is these um, patterns of skewing. So matrilineal and patrilineal skew. And that's when we uh, use kin terms across generations. So if we look in the center here, we can see that uh, on the right, so on your left, uh, my mother's brother and my mother's brother's son have the same kin term, so the same color. And then uh, on the other one, we have my father's sister, and my father's sister's daughter have the same kin term. So this pattern of skewing. And if we look through the literature um, at this time, there was a lot of hypothesis on why a particular terminology exists, a type of particular kinship terminology type exists, uh, and it was explained by these different patterns of kinship organization. I'm not going to explain the logic behind all of these, but to give one example. Uh, if you see on the bottom here, we have the bifurcate merging terminology. And this distinguishes what we call parallel cousins, so your parents, same sex siblings, children, from your parent, from your cross cousins, parents, opposite sex siblings, children, which is why we have some cousins that are red and some cousins that are green. So we have this linguistic distinction between particular types of cousins. And that was reason to link to some pattern of cross cousin marriage, which is the first two hypotheses on the right hand side. So there's this link between linguistic distinctions and behavioral distinctions. And so um, while there's some logic behind these, a lot of these hypotheses, the observational, uh, so the statistical evidence for them um, didn't account for a very common problem we talk about now, which is the non independence of languages. So what we wanted to do is, instead of using this co-occurrence statistic, so does this trait co-occur with this trait, can we account for the relationships between languages, and does that still support these hypotheses? Um, and so we did this across a number of uh, language families. So two of them, uh, so three language families, Bantu and Austronesian, and uto Azteca as well, which I haven't shown here. Um, and so this is what we call a uh, language phylogeny, if you're not familiar. Uh, we have the names of the languages down one side, and the branches, what we call branches, linking languages together is an indication of how um, of evolutionary time between those languages. And then we've plotted two traits on the tips, whether they have bifurcate merging terminologies or not. So this is the cross-cousin example. 
uh, which are the circles. And if it's black, they have that terminology. If it's white, they don't. Uh, and whether they have cross cousin marriage or not, black they have cross cousin marriage, white they don't. And what we then do is run some models saying, uh, do these traits depend on each other as they evolve down the tree, or do they not depend on each other? Um, and then we compare those models and say which one best explains the data we observe. Uh, and so we did that for all the hypotheses in three language families and found that a lot of them weren't supported. And I guess most surprisingly that none of them were supported in all language families. Now we didn't expect to find all of these hypotheses supported or even the majority of them, but we, some of them we did think would occur in most language families, which is not what we found. Um, so this kind of got us thinking, well, why is it that a lot of these um, hypotheses aren't uh, being reproduced? And if you're looking at contemporary kinship terminology literature, the most obvious conclusion would be, well, maybe these types aren't uh, really representative of diversity. And do we really think uh, all languages can be represented by the presence and absence of these two rules? Um, so that was kind of our main conclusion is that maybe we're just not thinking about kinship terminology diversity in an, a granular enough way. But we couldn't, couldn't figure that, uh, out if that was true or not without any data. So what we did next was to um, build a database of kinship terminology. So this was KinBank and it was a uh, big project across four universities. Um, we have around 1,200 languages of kinship terminology. Uh, and so I was working with at the University of Bristol with Fiona Jordan and Catherine Shird. There was also a team here at ANU with many of the people you would know. So Simon, who's now Max Planck, Nick Evans, who's in this corridor, Wolfgang and Kyla Quinn, who are all at ANU. Uh, and then we had two other teams uh, who are doing regional projects on kinship terminology. So Josh Birchall at the University of New Mexico is collecting kinship terminology on Tupi Carib languages in South America. And Terry Honkola uh, was collecting terminology on Uralic languages uh, up in Scandinavia and into Russia. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how Kin KinBank was developed. We have two core concepts in KinBank, the Kin category and the Kin term. And so the Kin category is the genealogical category of relatives that I was talking about earlier. So this is things like uh, father, mother, brother, sis sister, wife, and husband, and then combinations of that to create the genealogical web. And then for each of those categories, we apply a kin term. And the kin term can be applied to multiple categories, obviously. Uh, so, I missed a step before. For each of those kin categories, we also account for things like relative age, sex of speaker, um, and relative gender. And so then we have this database of genealogical relatives with the attached contour. Uh, it's important to mention that this doesn't capture all the variation we think exists in kinship terminology. Uh, and there's two aspects uh, that I'm going to talk about. The first is kinship range. So languages don't uh, extend kinship to the same number of relatives uh, as English, for example, or Languages never do it the same way. So it could be the case that uh, one language has more kinship terms than another. And we've developed KinBank in a way that we can extend the genealogical grid as much as we need to capture that. But some languages will have what we call a, a continuous or never ending system. So we can always apply kin term to somebody. And we're not going to capture that kind of diversity. But the other, I guess, more fundamental part is that we're not, we're not recording anything about meaning. So it could be the case that we have two languages with the same structure, but they don't. the kin terms within that structure don't mean the same thing. And that's an element of diversity we're not going to be analyzing here. Nevertheless, we're trying to, we're definitely increasing the level of um, complexity that we'd had previously in kinship terminology. Um, and you can go visit the website here at kinbank.net. It's live now. Um, don't look at it right now. I'm <laughs> talking, <laughs> but maybe later. Um, and so here's just some of the pages. So this is a distribution of the languages that we've collected. Um, so the University of Bristol was aiming to collect languages that uh, were in existing language phylogenies. So you can see some dense language family sampling, for example, in the Bantu language family, Pamanyung and Austronesian as well. Uh, and then we had the two regional types, uh, two regional collections of the Uralic family, 
up in Northern Europe and South, South America. And then uh, ANU had a strong focus in New Guinea, which is why we have like a big cluster there, but they were also collecting more generally as well. Uh, and then this is an example of just one of the pages of the language. So have a little bit of metadata on the language, where do we think it's located? You can look at the kinship terminology depending on whether it's a male speaker or a female speaker. That doesn't matter in Japanese, but it does matter in some languages. And then we have these diagrams for you to just kind of get a general idea of uh, how the structure of the language might look. So grandparents, siblings, that kind of thing. Okay, so now we've got this data, we can begin to explore kinship terminology in a much more granular fashion. And the first uh, question we looked at is, um, do we have intergenerational cohesion in kinship terminology? So what does that mean? Well, um, a basic assumption of the typology we were talking about earlier is that the way your parents and their siblings are organized is linked to the way your children, uh, their children and their siblings' children are organized. Um, and there's a lot of logic to that uh, assumption. So for example, I've got too many pages. Um, if we think about English, uh, all cousins are the children of aunts and uncles. But if we changes, change the organization of, organization of parents to say there's a category that includes both uncles and father under a term, say, funkles. Um, that was next choice of word, but I'm using it anyway. <laughs> so we have funkles. Um, if we still had the same organization in children, uh, it's a bit confusing because some children of uncles will be cousins and some children of uncles will be brothers or sisters. So that doesn't really make any sense. So the assumption of cohesion uh, is common sense in some sense, but um, now we have the data, we can see if it actually is true or not. Yeah. Um, and I, so basically what we did is categorize the top layer, uh, the parents and parents siblings, then categorize the siblings and cousins, and then build this uh, cross tabulation of tables. So every row is um, a different organization of parents and parents siblings, and every column is every is um, siblings and cousins. And I think the most striking point about this table is that uh, all but two of the cells are populated. So the assumption of this deterministic relationship between the generations um, doesn't seem supported. Uh, but it's not to say there's no synchrony. So more than half the languages are on the diagonal. So that's when we would expect that's a coherent relationship between parents and cousins, uh, and so G1 and G plus one. Um, so if we looked at, say, uh, we, it seems to be a like type dependence in this relationship. So if we look at the lineal organization, this is the organization we use in English. If you knew how the siblings and cousins organized, there's a good chance that that's how your parents and parents have been organized. But if your siblings and cousins were organized in a generational way, which is basically using a single term for all siblings and cousins, you don't know much about how the parents are organized. So there's this type dependence to the harmony in the structure of kinship terminology. Um, and so what we're seeing here is more diversity than the typology might have predicted, but still a level of recurrence in the structure. <clears throat> and so we wanted to go a level deeper than this. So what else could we, what's the next level of variation we could look at? And that's going to be, do these categories that we're using here even exist if we looked at all the diversity in kinship terminology? Um, and that's kind of leading us to the question of, well, how many types of terminology are there? Or at least how many types of kinship terminology are there in our database? Um, and the first hurdle uh, for doing that is trying to quantify kinship terminology in some way. So how do we get this list of words, the system of words into a way that we can analyze? And I do this uh, through what I call the structural vector, and it leverages the two types that we have, the two uh, key concepts in KinBank. We have the kin type. Uh, so here we have just example of three, which is male speaking elder brother, and male speaking elder sister, and male speaking younger brother. And we have the affiliated kin terms of English, uh, brother, sister, brother. So to create the structural vector, we're going to compare every kin type to every other kin type and say, do they have the same kin term or not? So if you look at the bottom, where this way I started doing that, we have male speaking elder brother equals male speaking elder sister. In English, those terms are brother and sister. They're not the same. We put it there. Uh, 
go to the next one, male speaking elder brother. Does that equal male speaking younger brother? They're both brother, we put a one. And we do that for all the languages. So to make this a bit more tractable, I split up the um, in-bank database into uh, generational subsets. So we have siblings, G0, which is uh, ego's generation, so siblings and cousins, G plus one, one generation above ego, parents and parents siblings. And in both of these, we also account for relative age, are they older or younger than ego or the connecting relative? Uh, and sex of speaker is the male or old female speaking. And we have G plus two, which is grandparents, and G minus one, which is your children and your siblings' children, which we also call nibblings. And that's the, the fun fact you can take home <laughs> and use later. Um, so this is a very generalized, uh, general look at the diversity we see in kinship terminology. And again, we see this trade off between recurrent uh, variability and recurrence. So if we looked at, say, uh, cousins, for example, which is the typology we were looking at earlier, where we were generalizing to six types, we actually see there are 259 types. It's um, of the 506 languages. So it's much smaller than six, uh, regardless of how we're looking at the languages. Um, but there's still a high level of constraint. So we have almost two structures per language if we took the ratio of those two number of languages and unique types. And so I worked on quite a few other databases uh, like grammar and uh, musical diversity. And in those, we don't see any level of occurrence. So to have two uh, structures recurring for every language suggests that there's a high level of structure in this data set. The final column is telling us how many possible organizations are there, given we have a restricted set of, cat of, um, of categories that we're comparing. Yeah. Um, and in general, we see this relationship between more possible categories and more types. Um, so, but again, we have this constraint. We don't see this. It's possible to observe 864 different systems. For example, if we're looking at siblings, but we only observe 87. Um, so we're, again, we're seeing this constraint. Uh, the most interesting, the main reason I put this last column in is because in grandparents, there are only 15 possible categories, but we have only observed 13. So what are the two that we're not seeing? Um, and the two that we're not seeing uh, are like this. So, so we have ego down the bottom, father, father, mother, then we have the four grandparents types, father's mother, father's father, mother's mother, father's father. Uh, and I've tried to indicate the categories that exist. So the two that don't exist uh, have two kin terms. Uh, one contem would be father's mother, father's father, mother's mother, and a separate word for mother's father, or the reverse, um, a term for father's father, mother's mother, mother's father, but not father's mother. So why don't these exist? Well, the only real reason we have is this rule of collater collaterality, which suggests that it's uh, not that it's not possible, but we never see the um, we never see the grouping of Cross cousin, cross kin, when we don't observe kin, parallel kin at the same time. Um, so the reason the cross kin is because the relative of who we're tracing through is the opposite gender to the person we're looking at. So we're going from here through a, a male to a female, or here to a female to a male. So there's this cross relationship. So why did we? Why does that rule exist? Well. No one's really looked at it that much, but 50 years ago, someone suggested it's something to do with the um, centrality of gender to kinship systems. I'm not really sure if that's true or not, but that's all we've got at the moment, but something to look into. So the next thing I did with these structural vectors I was mentioning earlier was um, to cluster them and ask the question is, well, we observe these small number of unique types are the unique types similar to each other that we can generalize them to a particular category and then derive this typology that we were talking about at the beginning. Um, so this involves a few more steps after the initial creation of the structural vector. Uh, step two is I've just done that for every language and we've got this big matrix. And then we want to figure out how similar each system is to the other system. So I do that using a measure called Jacquard's distance, um, which is effectively one minus the Jacquard similarity. So I'll explain Jacquard similarity, and it's just the opposite of that. <laughs> um, so Jacquard similarity is the number of features in common 
divided by the total number of features. So if we compare Bontok and English, uh, which is the bottom two rows of step two, you can see that they both have the hex skin. So that's the feature in common. And we're comparing three features. So it's one divided by three, 0 0.3. Then to get the distance, it's one minus 0 0.3. 7, and then we build this distance matrix, which is step four. And so now we know how similar uh, every language is to each other, and we can use that to um, as an input to these two algorithms, UMAP and HTTP scan. So UMAP is um, just projecting this distance matrix into a two-dimensional space so we can visualize the diversity. It doesn't really influence the analysis in any particular way, but it stands for uniform manifold, uniform manifold approximation, if you're interested. But we're mostly interested in this HDB scan uh, algorithm, which is a clustering algorithm uh, called hierarchical, hierarchical density based spatial clustering analysis. Um, but effectively, what it does is it's going to cluster the uh, languages we see based on how tightly packed they are in the space that we've created, mathematical space. And this is a nice clustering algorithm, algorithm for two reasons. One is that it does, we don't have to tell it how many clusters there are. We can just, it's going to automatically say how many clusters they are based on how, based on one parameter that we give it, which is based on uh, density. So how close the things need to be for them to be considered the same. And I choose that parameter uh, by minimizing the number of outliers we have. And that's the second reason why this is uh, a good algorithm is that we don't have to put a language in a cluster. It can be an outlier. Um, and I think that's a closer, uh, Closer to reality than a lot of other clustering albums we've seen. So we'll go to these two columns on the end here, uh, the number of clusters and the number of silhouette scores uh, and the silhouette score. So number of clusters is much lower than the number of unique types. So that's telling us that the assumption I had we had before that unique types are similar in some way that they might have some unifying principle beneath them. But it's still much more, clusters, many more clusters than the typology we had before. If we're looking at G0, you see there's 17 types overall. So, um, again, things are more diverse than the typology has been existing, but still constrained to some degree. Uh, the silhouette score is giving us a measure of how structured that space is. So, how tight clustered are the clusters we're looking at. And if we uh, look at something like siblings or grandparents, the score is very high, so the max is out at one. That's telling us that all the clusters we see are very tight, all the languages are very similar in those clusters. When we look at something like cousins, we have a very low score. Some of the clusters are very diverse and they don't not well defined. Um, and we'll see what it is in the next picture. So this graph here is the output of UMAT, the unifold, uniform manifold approximation. Um, and what it is is a visualization of this similarity space that we've created. So each dot is a language, uh, and the languages are colored by what cluster they belong to. And if they're gray, then they're outliers. Um, get to the next page. And there's no axis on these plots, which you may have noticed. Uh, and that's because we're not interested in the dimensions, we're interested in similarity. So the distance between two points is indicative of how similar they are but it doesn't matter in what direction. So if you made it, you can imagine a situation where there's three languages in a line. The first one is similar to the second one as the second one is to the third one, but the first one and the third one are more distant to each other. So we're just thinking about it in terms of distance, like a map almost. Um, <clears throat> and so what we want to know is, do we observe this typology that we had at the beginning? And in general, we do. There are these parts of the space that are inhabited by um, systems that are structured in the way the typology suggests, but there's a lot of internal variation. So if you look at lineal, that's the organization we use in English, a separation of um, siblings and cousins. What is the variation we're looking at? Uh, and a lot of this is um, all these languages will set, all these clusters rather, will separate the nuclear family from cousins, but how they define those categories is going to be different. So for example, you could have English, brother, sister, and cousin, or you could have a, another cluster would be like French, brother, sister, cousin, and cousin, so gendered cousin terms. You can also change how the siblings are organized. Uh, so instead of having gendered cousin, uh, gendered sibling terms, you could have older, younger sibling terms, so brother, elder brother and elder sister are one term, 
younger brother, younger sister at one time. Or you could have both, uh, elder brother, younger brother, elder sister, younger sister, and a single cousin term. This is all the variation that we we're ignoring with the previous typology. Um, another thing we're seeing here is the type dependency that we talked about earlier. We can see that the lineal clusters are quite tight. Uh, language is very similar within those. But then we get into these bifurcate collateral, bifurcate merging terminologies. It's like kind of a big mess. And this is interesting because the bifurcate collateral um, and bifurcate merging types would be the areas of terminology that have been studied the most. And um, mainly because they link to these, they have these more obvious links to patterns of behavior, such as uh, the cousin marriage example we talked about earlier. And it seems to be a lot more diversity there than um, we maybe have thought before. Yeah, and the final point is there's a lot of languages that seem to not be able to be clustered at all, and so that warrants further investigation. Sam, could I interrupt with a question? Why are there two linear two linear? Uh, it's, I think it's just a function of um, how the space has been projected. So if you can imagine this is actually a multi-dimensional space. So it could be in a third or fourth dimension, they're very close to each other, mm -hmm. but we have to project it into a two dimensions and so they get separated for whatever reason. Um, I can't specifically remember why those two groups are separate, but it would be something to do with those second order differentiations since I mentioned earlier. So maybe it could be that one is gendered cousins and one's not gendered cousins, for example. Um, so now we're kind of at a point where we've established kinship terminology is much broader than the typology we started with, um, but it's also not unconstrained. So can we explain the constraints kind of back at square one again? Um, and, and we've got this added question is, do we actually even care about this extra diversity? So these are kind of the questions I'm at now, and we're going back to the beginning again and saying, does kinship terminology link to behavior from this more granular um, perspective? So the constraints we have is uh, social organization, there's a suggestion of cognitive mechanisms and uh, the impact of language history. And I just submitted a grant to take us all the way to the beginning again and start again with a small granular data set. <laughs> um, that was kind of the end of my kinship terminology stuff. And I'm gonna change tact a little bit now uh, and talk about kinship terms and their relationship to individuals' behavior. And this is part of a pre-registered study I did during my PhD. Um, and how do I introduce this again? So kind of the underlying assumption throughout this whole talk is that kinship terminology tells us something about how people behave. Um, and so I wanted to do a more direct test of this by using um, a kind of economic game situation. Um, and so we kind of, I wanted to trade off these two different models of kinship. So if we look at English, uh, we have this distinction between sister and cousin. But if we look at Hindi, those terms are the same. And does that affect how people treat those individuals if we had to trade them off? So if we took a very strict biological approach and applied kin selection theory, we would say that most people, regardless of their cultural background, should be preferring to help closer genealogical relatives than more distant genealogical relatives. And that just happens to align with the English kinship terminology. But there are kinship terminologies that don't align line like that. So are people going to behave in, with respect to their cultural heritage, or is there this underlying genealogical uh, biological thing that's uh, working on us, which seems a bit weird? And um, so what we did is we had an online survey where we had, uh, which was in English and in Hindi, and um, we explained the relationships between the individuals, uh, or it's translated into Hindi without using the kin terms. And then we ask them, ask the participant to help, in this case, Olivia, uh, decide where she's going to spend her resources or time. Is she going to spend it between the two, uh, they have more time with one relatives or more time with the others. And the reason we choose these scenarios is because they had existed in, um, they're already in the literature, is suggested to have this trade off between social and genetic costs. So it's not going to really affect your fitness if you miss your sister's birthday, but maybe it will if you don't save her when she's drowning. Um, and so we did this with 100 Hindi speakers and 100 English speakers, so 100 Hindi speakers who did the survey in Hindi, 100 English speakers who performed the survey in English, and 50 Hindi speakers who did the survey in English and spoke English. 
and maybe we should have expected this, but everyone basically just clicked down the middle and uh, equally shared everything. <laughs> but there was like a, uh, we did force people to choose if they did click down the middle, but it seemed more appropriate to show the results where people could choose down the middle. We do see very slight preferences in the way we would expect under a cultural model. So that is that, so HH is Hindi speakers performing in Hindi, tend to perform more, uh, distribute re resources more evenly regardless of the situation. Whereas English speakers almost always prefer their genealogical sister and their cultural sister. In the, as we increase the genetic cost of the scenarios, we see a general shift towards helping the sister, uh, but it's very small. Uh, and it's always the case that Hindi Hindi um, participants, so Hindi speakers performing the survey in Hindi, uh, were always more egalitarian regardless of the situation. We had the, um, the third population we had was the Hindi speakers perform in English, uh, and they seem to perform more extreme than the English speakers. So tending to prefer the sister more often than we would expect under the English speakers. I don't really know why that is. Um, it might be an element of exaggerating cultural biases that you know exist in the language you're acting in, but I haven't really looked into it. And um, this is kind of an area that I'd be interested to explore more on if people are interested in it. Um, that was kind of a short study at the end. So just a quick summary of all the papers that I went through. Uh, so first we looked at kinship typology and didn't seem to show a strong link to kinship behavior. You can all go and look at their website, KinBank now. Um, we didn't see a strong uh, relationship in, between generations in kinship terminology, um, but there might be some type dependencies. Uh, we were looking at how kinship terminology diversity is much more diverse than we might have expected um, than typology expected, but it's not also an unconstrained. And now we're going to go back to the beginner, beginning and see if we can link it to behavior using this more granular data set. And then uh, I was talking briefly about uh, the relationship between kinship terminology and individual decisions. Um, but that was, I think that's an area that needs a lot more explanation before we draw any hard conclusions on what happened. Excuse me. Yeah. So please email me if you have, uh, if you talk, want to talk to me more about stuff or we can do some questions now. Um, thank you very much.